to call my grandfather. So which is the, my grandfather is a local, uh, the Hebei province's very famous the TCM doctor. So somehow they range the tea to from the tube inject to my stomach. So after three days, the fever just got gone. And the five days after, and the way out to hospital and the 10 days after I'm completely recovery back to normal. So that's why my mother reminded me, you have to be a doctor, you have to be helping people. And I just from little, I says, that's my come from. So I have to be a doctor. But in, in that time, I even don't know what kind of doctor I want to be. So in, the, in 1979, I went to medical school. So the Gansu University, so of a traditional Chinese medicine school. So they have programs, so which is offer uh, Western medicine, uh, TCM medicine together. So uh, almost like a 40% Western medicine training and a 60% Chinese medicine training. So I'm graduating from there. So and uh, after school training, I get my license and I luckily to uh, to have a fellowship with the the Gansu University affiliated hospital to finish the four years the training for OBGYN, which is in Western medicine, Chinese medicine doctor. So and we totally be able to this opportunity give us so totally understand from both medicine, how to complement each other to understand both medical system, how to working and then cooperating, collaborating each other to helping people. And I, today's days, I think it really gave me lots of strengths in a clinical setting to helping people even more further. And after that, so, and after, I just want to broaden my knowledge into more populations reached out. So I just, to change to internal medicine field for three more years and uh, got a fellowship with the doctor, Beijing University, followed the doctor, Zhang, uh, Shang Xianmin. So we have a study, special study, endocrine system. So diabetes, kidney failure, and uh, also arthritis. That's our main, main topic. And we did the research uh, special according so kidney failure, how to use combined Chinese medicine with Western medicine combination, how to prolong patient's uh, life and how to how to prolong the patient's life and how to save to avoid to avoid it to dialysis. So we did lots of we got a word in 19 uh like 1992, so we got awards. We really happy about it. So after that, a long line. So and then we just follow my husband to came to this country and uh, 1992 actually. So and then we um, founded this TCM healings at 1997. After that, and then we continue working and also I inspired my further blend my interests to in Western and the TCM together to even further in women's health. Since then, so I was special working all sorts of, kind of condition, internal medicine, uh, special in gynecology, including women's health, and then now some more for infertility source, et cetera. So that's my story. So I guess I'm really happy to working here and uh, like I said, I love this medicine and I believe so everyone so deserve to get help. So, and I'm here to helping everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane. Um, the next person we're gonna have introduce himself a little bit is Dr. Bell Liu himself. Go ahead, Dr. Liu. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carmen, for holding this. This is great. I think we have a great opportunity to meet with all the patients and give a little bit of uh, introdu introduction. I think that's uh, great. Uh, so uh, I have a very similar, uh, you know, the uh, educational uh, background uh, with Dr. Jean. 
Uh, the reason I choose to be an uh, acupuncturist, I think when I was very young, when I was very little uh, during Cultural Revolution, I always, I often saw the movie, you know, the movie and uh, some patient, they, they can talk and uh, the acupuncturist put a needle in their neck or head or somewhere and the patient started talking. They, they never be able to talk for a long time and then they started talking and the, you know what's the first word that they say? Long live Chairman Mao. So oh, that was a during Cultural Revolution. I was so impressed. What's that? You know, tiny little bit of needle can treat the patient and they start talking. And some patient, you know, they cannot hear. you totally deaf uh, after needle in. They can, they can hear, they can talk, they can sing the sound. Uh, and uh, so that was the impression of me. The tiny little bit of needle can do such a great job. And when I was uh, maybe 12, 13 years old, uh, one time I got a severe headache, a very severe headache. My parents took to an acupuncturist. Uh, that's the first time I had an acupuncture. They needled my uh, head and the hand somewhere. The headache instantly was gone. I was very impressed because that was the first time I accept, you know, I had an acupuncture uh, treatment and so effective. Um, and of course, uh, uh, when we study, uh, you know, same as Dr. Jin, we went to the Chinese medical school. We learned both Western medicine and East medicine. Uh, once we graduated, because that's the medical field, when I graduated, I choose to study acupuncture as my major uh, because uh, uh, the one of my school, the teacher, he's very famous and a very famous acupuncturist. So if I work in the acupuncture department, I would learn from him. Uh, so that's the first opportunity. And then I went to Beijing for additional training. Another very famous acupuncture, everybody knows. He's the chief author for the point location. So he's the final uh, decision where the point located. Uh, so the, he's the final decision. Um, so after that, you know, I'm very interested in uh, the study and the uh, when I came to the United States, uh, you know, we're very happy. We have opportunity uh, to, to help the patient for all, you know, all kind of the condition, particularly locally. And we also appreciate, uh, you know, we have uh, so many patients who are supporting us and uh, to continue refer the patient to the clinic. So to make us uh, to be, uh, you know, a smooth and stable and in the business. So we really appreciate that. Uh, last four, last, uh, since 19, uh, um, since 2014, I started teaching, teaching all over the world. Um, so I had, uh, you know, the face-to-face uh, -face teaching probably, uh, you, know, clo you know, close to 100, um, you know, the uh, classes and also in, on the internet. On the internet, uh, one time I went to Hong Kong, we had a big conference, uh, which I speak with the, uh, the world, uh, the acupuncture or chairman of the world acupuncture organization. Uh, the globally, there's 400,000 people watching on the, on the program. That was a very big promotion for myself uh, to be able to speak in, you know, in, the, in, in, in this field. And now mostly I teach uh, the student who graduated from PCM school or already got a doctorate degree and this even practiced 20, 30 years in the clinic. But sometimes I feel the clinical skill, it's not uh, uh, comfortable enough, they still need a continued education. So I'm mostly teaching for those people. And this month we had, uh, you know, the class uh, over 155. That's a lot according, you know, according the, the, the class, because it's not a free class. People most of the time get maybe 30 students, 20 students, I got 150. That's a lot, that's a good compromise. And also sometimes I give, uh, um, you know, like a free speech or, you know, sometimes just for uh, totally for, um, you know, the certain acupuncture uh, community. 
um, in New York, in San Francisco, but each time there's more than 500 acupuncturists attending the class. Uh, so I'm very uh, pleased we have this opportunity to serve the patient and uh, of course, the, uh, for the medically, the never ending, we want to uh, you know, continue learning and uh, to be better practitioner and uh, to serve and uh, help the patient um, you know, continue to raise our, the, uh, you know, the skill and uh, help the patient more as, and more. And so that's my brief uh, introduction and uh, thank you for everyone. And uh, so next will be the Dr. Lin will be to, uh, you know, the, I will give it back to the Carmen there. She's the host. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Liu, for your wonderful story. Um, the next person to give a brief introduction will be Dr. Lim herself. And whenever you're ready, Dr. Lim. Hi, everyone. So um, this is Dr. Lim. I've been working with Dr. Jing and Dr. Liu for, I think, almost 13 years now. Um, but uh, I guess my interest in Chinese medicine um, began, I guess, since I was little, I've always been interested in health and I did a lot of martial arts um, through high school and college, and so that kind of got me interested in, in the more holistic ways of healing and um, health. And also, I think growing up, um, you know, I'm a first generation Chinese American, so my mom, whenever I got sick when I was little, she would always give me herbs to take. She would, I, I almost, I can't remember, you know, almost ever taking antibiotics for when I got a cold, so, um, and so, I think growing up in that environment made me also appreciate the Chinese herbal medicine more. Um, and so when I was in, I guess after after college, um, I decided to study Chinese medicine. Um, and at first I was gonna study Chinese medicine here in the States, but my dad, my dad's from Shanghai. So, you know, he told, he said, well, if you're gonna study Chinese medicine, you should go to China to study. So I listened to, to his advice, um, thankfully, and I, I ended up going to Shanghai. Um, and I studied there for a total of six years. I lived there. Um, the Chinese, you know, the Chinese medicine medical degree program there is five-year program. And so similar to Dr. Jing and Dr. Liu, it's, it's an integrated East, Eastern and Western medicine uh, program. And um, it's probably one of the best experiences in my whole life. But um, really, originally when I, you know, when I went to, first went to China, I was, I think I was actually more interested in the acupuncture and learning acupuncture because um, there was all this, I guess, you know, mysticism around acupuncture and the chi and energy. And so, um, but as I continued my studies in, in, in China, actually, I came to realize that the, I really started to love the herbal medicine. And um, at that time, I was having a lot of kind of gynecological menstrual issues, um, which tend to run in my mom's side of the family. So, so my mom had a history, she had breast cancer in her 40s. Um, and then a lot of her sisters and my cousins, we, we have a tendency towards like things like fibroids and all these like, estrogen dependent issues. And so um, I remember while I was during my studies in China, I, I prescribed some Chinese herbal medicine for myself and I took it for a very, you know, like a month or so. And I, I really noticed a significant improvement um, in my overall symptoms. And so, and that really like got me interested in, in you know, how does Chinese medicine help treat, treat um, female issues as well as gynecological issues? And so that really made me kind of passionate about learning um, Chinese medicine for, for female hormonal issues. Um, so I did my uh, residency training at some of Shanghai's um, East-West Integrative Hospitals. Um, and my focus was, my main interest, I guess, it was my was the gynecology, but also like cancer oncology related um, oncology department. So in China, they really, when they treat oncology patients, for example, they really integrate the Western and Eastern herbal uh, Western medicine as well as the herbal medicine, and um, especially, you know, during the years after the they treat the patient for cancer, the patient con continues to take the herbal medicine to help to keep the cancer in remission. And so I had done. Um, after I graduated that, those five years of uh, training, I decided to stay in China another extra year to kind of have my focus on gynecology and also oncology department, uh, TCM department. And so that was kind of my background in, in terms of what I studied in China. Um, when I came back to the States, I actually, I decided to get my clinical 
I, I saw that Yosan was having a doctoral program in um, um, women's women's health and for and fertility. So I, you know, I immediately signed up, and that was actually the first first doctoral cohort cohort um, I think in California for like female gynecological issues. And so um, during my studies there, I actually what my focus was on was on um, immunological recurrent miscarriage, and so I did a my thesis on a, lit, a literature review synthesis on uh, recurrent miscarriage due to immuno, immunological reasons. And so, so since starting, you know, acupuncture with Dr. Jing and Dr. Liu, um, you know, originally when I came back to the states, I I only knew I really felt like I I learned a lot of the theory of acupuncture and how it works, but I you know in terms of practical application and clinical application, I didn't know understand how acupuncture really worked, right? So I think um, working at the clinic and seeing so many patients um, through these years, I, I really begin to appreciate more how acupuncture works on the body and how much it can help with like pain relief and just, you know, helping patients feel better. So I, besides having an appreciation for the Chinese herbal medicine part, I really appreciate the acupuncture part even more um, than when I first started. So. Um, so I think that's about it. And then also, I, I do have I've been doing a lot of tai chi, tai chi chen, tai chi chen for the past more than twenty years now. So I do enjoy doing that as well. Um, and I guess I think that's it. Hopefully, I didn't forget anything. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lin. Um, so thank you everyone for your introductions. We're gonna go ahead and start with the general questions. During this part, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint slides to go ahead and complement the general questions. So we're gonna start with Dr. Liu. Um, just give me a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and open up my screen here. Okay, so we're gonna have Dr. Liu answer the very first question is, um, how does acupuncture help in general and help with male fertility? And go ahead, Dr. Liu. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. Uh, so, um, you know, that's a really a big, uh, you know, very big topic. So I just want to explain a little bit about the acupuncture. Uh, how the acupuncture works, so the acupuncture really works in the meridian system. By for the decades, you know, for 50, 60 years in China, the medical scientists try to find out what's the meridian, you know, what's the single tissue holds the meridian, like the nervous system or mus musculoskeletal system, and they fail. They can't find this system. But after, you know, by they do prove the system it exists. Uh, they find that, uh, you know, according to this uh, chart, you see the meridian. We said there's a 12 meridian, major meridian, and that there's another branch meridian. By 12 meridian, uh, the run is through one place to another place. According to this channel, this meridian, uh, the doctor, you know, the medical scientists find that the sound conduction and the heat conduction and the electrical conduction are much greater than the tissue around it. So they do find that there's a channel. Uh, by the questions, it's a very a mystery, you know, still you know, the mystery and the, how the people in the ancient times, thousands of years ago, <laughs> discovered that. But one way or another, as an acupuncturist, so even though we don't necessarily know exactly how they find it, but most important, we know how to make it work. What do we do, patient responding. Uh, 20 years ago, in UC Irvine, there's a few, uh, you know, professor did the research. They find out that the meridian system directly access to the brain cortex. A certain point that will open up the visual cortex or, or a certain point that helps for the certain part of the brain. And that's the first time they find uh, there's a direct access. Uh, so we know from the needle you know, acupuncture point, we can help in, you know, enhance the body healing and help promoting the brain uh, you know, to help a certain, you know, like endocrine system for male-female condition to help promoting for the immune system for all those. 
Uh, but of course, uh, what we say, acupuncture, because a lot of the time when the patient come to see us, some patients say, I like, you know, I like a witch doctor. I like, a big, I say, how come? They say, this is a very good doctor. I say, why? Because I don't feel any pain. I feel, you know, painless. Yes, you know, to um, not to hurt, that's uh, very important. Uh, but, you know, we, we say to be a good acupuncturist, you need to be beyond work for that. Because sometimes we can do very gently. You can hardly feel anything. But for certain condition, if you have a severe pain or if you are condition, condition is very serious. We want the tip of the needle to reach the meridian. When the tip of the needle reach the meridian, they will always uh, produce a slightly, you know, a little bit of sensation, aching, or sometimes a muscle twitching one time. Uh, that's what you know, help you the most, uh, help you therapeutically the most. So we need to find out the good balance. Sometimes we want to you know, do gentle, but for certain conditions, serious condition, we want to do a little bit of stronger manipulation, not the painful, but, you know, painful, painful, but, you know, you, if, you, if you tolerate better, and you will, you know, sometimes you get a better result. So that's why we say, in order to, you know, to uh, say which doctor good or not, uh, just for, you know, just by feeling, if I feel the sensation or not, uh, that's not enough to, uh, you know, to give the, uh, you know, uh, and also acupuncture is this. Um, we work in the meridian system. Sometimes if we got a good spot, we don't need to do a lot. It's not like more. It's that it's not like we use uh, uh, some bullet to shoot a target. The more we shoot, there's better chance to get. No, it's not like if you get it, it's like a key open big lock. The key, it's uh, so small, but they can open the big lock. You don't need a much bigger tool to open the lock. And so that's why I want the patient uh, to be able to understand in the whole picture of the acupuncture, the treatment. Um, you know, just like if you exercise just for relaxation, you can do gentle. But if you want the training for Olympics, you have to sweat a lot. You have to work in very hard. Even in the beginning, your muscle hurt, but you will get much more compromise down the road for you, you know, for you to do. So that's a typically what the acupuncture treatment about, you know, of course, in our clinic, Dr. Jean, Dr. Lim, they both are great. Uh, they both are very considerate for the patients. So you, uh, wherever you come, so you really get the best care. And then I just want to talk a little bit about male infertility. Male infertility, it's this, in, in Chinese medical theory, uh, we everybody treat as a tonifying the kidney uh, because there's all the saying uh, you want the you know the man the kidney energy never uh, enough never be enough so you always need a tonify uh, so that's why it just matter questions it's a matter of tonify kidney yin tonify kidney yang but I don't you know I done a lot of research in the past we watch the hundreds case. The patient coming, we tonify kidney yin, some patient tonify kidney yang, some patient tonify kidney qi. After a few months, like four months, the patient, is, you know, male patient, the, the sperm does not change very much. Sometimes get worse, sometimes maybe hold a st steady. Uh, but a lot of more, a lot of people get worse. We don't understand, you know, why typical tonic treatment does not help enhance the male reproductive system. But that's a traditional, classical treatment. What's wrong with it? And then after a while, I figure out the pay. You know, in the past, when we talk about the kidney tonic to for the help the reproductive system. It's in the in the past in China. You know, the man has a seven, eight wives. Some men, it's a 70 years old. They have a 20 years old wife. In order to keep up with a 20 years old wife, they need to they need to kind of find a kidney or to help their reproductive system. That's a really the, you know, that's a really, it's a different, different now. But now in the United States, we see a lot of, you know, infertility patient, a man, very young, you know, 30, 40 years old, their kidney energy, it's not that weak. But the problem we find out, I find out it's the 
a toxicity. The toxicity in Chinese medicine we call could be a damp heat, it could be some chemical toxicity or biotoxicity, which means it could be fungus or virus or germs or some kind of parasite systemically to affect the reproductive system. So in my treatment, I find, uh, you know, when I clear up, help the immune system get rid of the biotoxicity or help the chemical toxicity, their sperm quality and all quality and the quantity always get better. So that's uh, that's why, you know, sometimes I have a patient come back to say, doctor, you know, I saw other acupuncture, they say you need a tonifying kidney, why you don't treat my tonify my kidney? Of course, acupuncture point, we can tonify kidney, but I say the herbal wise, the herbal wise, but you know, I say everyone are different. You know, we have to, what we call, we do differentiation to figure out what's your specific condition in order to treat it. So, you know, if we do this, the patient responded always much better. And with the herbs, you know, same as acupuncture, um, you know, some people complain the herbs too bitter, uh, don't want to take it. Some people say acupuncture, I, I hurt, I'm too sensitive. Uh, you can barely touch me, I'm jump. Uh, but, you know, we want to say, if you don't take herbs, you, acupuncture is too painful for you. We really have no way to, to help you. It's like uh, you want to go to New York. You say, I can't fly because I get dizzy. I'm scared of airplane. So then what? You're going to walk to the New York? You still have to fly. Or you can take the train, but you can't take the train to the Europe. So that's why we say we have some physical imbalance. We have some issues. In order to get this issue fixed, we need to tolerate something. We have it's like a working. We're working very hard. We we sacrifice some um, you know resting time, but then you're supporting your family. So that would be nice. Everybody take a vacation. You get paid, and you don't have to. So in life, we really suffer some you know mild suffer something in order to gain what we want a goal. So that's the typical. And the plus everything we do. Whatever acupuncture herbs you do for help your specific condition, uh, relatively it's a short term. It's not a forever. So uh, even you suffer a little bit with the you know the taste better and you know the herbs or the acupuncture. But in the future, when you get the results, you'll be really happy what you've done. It. Okay, so that's a brief, uh, you know, the uh, introduction, and uh, uh, so I uh, I give it back to Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu, for your thorough explanation on how acupuncture generally works. I also do think it is important to modify our treatment according to each individual, so thank you for that. I guess in the next part, to be a little bit more specific, Dr. Lim, can you answer how acupuncture helps on a more fertility level and how it can help patients? Okay, sure. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to kind of talk about how acupuncture helps promote um, general hormonal balance and also how it's really helpful for both male and female fertility, kind of expounding on what Dr. Liu has talked about. Um, so from, from a general TCM perspective, when we're treating patients for fertility, we really just try to promote overall, you know, proper flow of energy, energies and blood through the blood circulation through the body, through the channels. Um, if you look at the picture of the um, acupuncture, the na naked guy with the acupuncture points on his body, um, you can kind of see that there are <laughs> certain points, um, certain channels that we tend to primarily focus on, especially for um, male and female fertility. Um, for example, um, the spleen, liver, and kidney channels, for a female especially, they run along the inside of the leg. They kind of start from the toes and they go up through the groin area and they go through the digestive abdominal organs. Um, those ones, especially, we can we tend to find a lot of uh, when we palpate, we find a lot of achy tender points along those channels, oftentimes. And so, when we find those, you know, achy tender points, for example, we we will put a needle in it, um, and that will usually when the tenderness tells us that there's some sort of stagnation along the channel. And so, when you put uh, when you do acupuncture along those channels, it can help to unblock the energy flow and unblock the stagnation stagnation along the channel. Um, for, um, in terms of the, the, there's also, you know, the back channels along the back. So that's the urinary bladder channel and also the, um, the gallbladder and um, 
the stomach channels, those are the yang meridians. So we, we sometimes also will do those points as well. Um, especially the, for females, the pelvic points, the points around the sacrum area and the lower back and the lumbar area, we often do those um, to help unblock the energy through the bladder channel. And um, so that's kind of from a TCM perspective, um, how the acupuncture works. And so next, um, so next acupuncture, in the next slide, we're gonna show how um, acupuncture can help a lot with, um, you know, reducing overall stress in the body. And so as everyone knows, you know, stress has a really big impact um, on the, your whole system, right? So when patients are, have a lot of chronic stress, which a lot of us have these days, um, it can definitely affect your energy levels. It can cause increased inflammation in the body um, because of the cortisol levels going, can go up. Um, you know, patients oftentimes complain of brain fog or lowered immune system, chronic infections when they're, when they're under chronic stress. Um, it can make it harder for you to recover from illness if, you, if you're under a lot of stress. And also you can, the, what the acupuncture does, it helps to decrease, to kind of decrease the overall stress response in the body, helps to relax the sympathetic nervous system. So it helps to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your kind of rest and digest uh, part of the, your nervous system. And it also helps to um, regulate your, your kind of hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. So basically when you're, when you're under a lot of stress, what can happen is that your adrenals start to kind of go, you know, over functioning. And when that happens, it can actually inhibit the hormonal system, right? So that can cause, it, that can actually inhibit ovulation. Um, it can cause decreased progesterone secretion. Um, and so, acupuncture can help with promoting ovulation and also helping with estrogen and progesterone function in the body. Um, and so when, when your parasympathetic nervous system is, is active, is more, is, you know, turned on, what happens is there, there's increased blood flow to your reproductive and your digestive organs as well. So that's really good for both male and female fertility. Um, so the next slide, um, we're going to talk about how just in general, how acupuncture, because it helps improve the overall energy flow and blood circulation through the pelvic area and through the digestive organs, um, it, but in particular the pelvic area, it can actually help, for women, it can help increase the uterine blood flow and help improve endometrial receptivity. So um, sometimes we'll combine it with moxibustion or electrostimulation, especially, for example, if a woman is going through an IVF cycle, we'll do the, me and Dr. Jean will both, and Dr. Liu will do the electrostimulation on the abdominal points or the leg points to help improve the blood flow going to the, through the pelvic region and help to, it also helps to dilate the arteries that are in the pelvic region, um, thus promoting more blood flow. Um, another thing, so the next slide, um, these are just some articles from, re, like research articles that I found online through PubMed, and so, um, I just thought I would put them here in case anyone's interested in them. But basically, um, acupuncture can also help with, uh, like I talked about before, helps with estrogen progesterone function, especially if you're going through an IVF um, retrieval or transfer cycle. Um, it helps, we talked about it helping the thickening the uterine lining for implantation. So like, for example, some patients, they've had, sometimes the lining doesn't grow thick enough um, during a transfer cycle. And so what happens is they'll, after, you know, starting with the herbs and acupuncture with us um, on the next transfer cycle, it actually will help with the thickening of the uterine lining. And so that's really important because you, you want to, you know, you, know, you want to thicken up lining to help implantation. Um, and so next we're going to talk about um, how acupuncture helps with reducing overall um, Oh, th this one is actually, so this one, this one is just an article I found. So a lot of times we'll, we'll see like patients who have polycystic ovarian function. Um, and so what the acupuncture can do, and especially with the herbs combined with the herbs, it can help with patients who have like kind of more of an androgenic environment in the body, causing the ovaries to not mature properly, which can then cause polycystic ovaries. And so the acupuncture and even by itself, even without moxibustion, a lot of times we can, by opening up the energy flow through the body and helping to, you know, 
help to balance the, the neuroendocrine function, we can actually help patients increase their, patients with PCOS um, have more regular periods again. And so the next one is another way that acupuncture can really help with just promoting overall health and help with um, cases where uh, a lot of times, um, like, you know, male or female issues, for example, male men can get prostatitis or um, a lot of pelvic pain due to prostate issues. And women can also oftentimes experience um, kind of inflammatory gynecological issues, some, such as, you know, endometriosis or fibroids. So what the acupuncture can help with is reducing overall inflammation. And so, um, and that's also through the whole mechanism of like reducing stress. So when you reduce stress, the inflammation also decreases. Um, and so the next slide will show how for men, they found that sometimes men who have um, genital tract inflammation, for example, it can oftentimes be due to the increased temperature within this, the scrotum area. So the acupuncture they found helps to reduce the scrotal temperature and thus reduce the inflammation in the, in the genital tract. Um, and so the next slide also we show how acupuncture can help with men who have um, issues like pro chronic prostatitis. So when we do acupuncture either in the local area where the in the lower abdominal or just along the channels in the body by balancing their, their their overall energy flow, um, the acupuncture can help reduce inflammation, inc improve the quality of life for, for men with prostatitis, and also reduce the chronic pelvic pain that they may be having. And so I think, let's see what else. Um, I think that's, is that it? Oh, okay, last, last, I think it's the last one, okay. So this is, um, so and kind of like I mentioned before, women who have like really painful crampy periods or clotty periods, who have you know fibroids or endometriosis, um, who have a lot of premenstrual cramps, the acupuncture can help as well with these type of issues. And so um, I think I mentioned before, we we do treat a lot of the spleen, liver, kidney channels. Sometimes the rent, the the rin channel, which goes down the center of the body through the pelvic area, or the dew channel which kind of like goes up the back of the spine and up through the head. So we treat all these channels that go through this whole pelvic area and also the legs. Um, and so I think that's it for now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lang, for her thorough explanation on fertility acupuncture. And I guess because people come for treatment is that oftentimes, especially new patients, call our front desk and ask, oh, I sometimes feel worse right after treatment, and why is that? And Dr. Jane's going to help walk us through some of the reasons why that might be. Uh, Dr. Jane, when you're ready, we'll have you on. Okay. So, and uh, especially for first time patient, usually people coming. So, and uh, because your body is the first time coming, so as a practitioner, we assess your body. So, if your body quite balanced, you don't feel that, that we call, it cannot cause side effect, but you don't feel strongly. Some people never into acupuncture, it's the first time. So, and if you, right after your treatment so if it's the treatment for example if you have emotion that day so you're really sad a long time depressed or whatever you come into acupuncture for sleeping issue but and you immediately feel you sad you cry a lot so after treatment you feel emotionally even more stressed and more stressed you say like, oh acupuncture that's not working for me it's not so acupuncture is really working the channel through I really explain to patients acupuncture like a uh, subway. Our body like subway runs through. Each subway have to flow properly. Every subway, every channel have their own design function. So each acupuncture only clean up. So 35 most the, the, the traffic. So if you really want to regularly to continually in the first time, which is your you body so trapped, so much traffic, which like clean up, and your body just like, oh, big, big, big wake up. So 
so you can call side effective you can feel so sad so depressed or some people you just come beginning actually you body fighting some viral we call wind attack but you even your body don't know this time some people can acting up like a oh sore throat coming or like a feel headache feel diarrhea feel dizzy feel sick so that kind of things is just like a acupuncture to encourage you your body open the, the viral the wind attack to the surface sp speed up your body to detox so that when that happens don't worry call us back and if you have herbs usually practitioner already gave the herbs take the herbs right away and you you just call us give us a call so you you should feel fine so as generally speaking after acupuncture when you come into acupuncture you should be really relax then you not hurry you'll give yourself luxury time and the breathing through after acupuncture you should be drinking two or three cups of warm water and after 30 minutes do not right away go into exercise right away after 30 40 minutes to go exercise this way is the really best way to help your body so most of the time people just feel imbalanced when your body imbalanced the way so you feel big response for acupuncture but we do not call side effective you just give us a call we people just feel great that's the thing i'm done hope thank you so answer all the questions thank you so much dr jane um the next part we're going to talk about is more of the herbal medicine a lot of times patients always ask us what are herbs and what do the ingredients do all of our herbs are labeled in the latin form and most medicine is from the latin form as well so that is very hard to understand i'm gonna have dr bill Liu kind of explain a little bit more in depth on what herbs are from a chinese perspective Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, yeah, the herbs works. Um, you know, the most of the time, the you know, the Western scientist or doctor are searching for what's the ingredients, what's the chemical structure which are working. Um, but reality, it's a herbal remedy. It's beyond that. We know certain, you know, the chemical structure has a certain function, but herbs work. Sometimes it's beyond that. For example, the when the baby cry in the night, we use we use the gold. You know, let's say your good ring, good necklace. You boil it for thirty minutes, and then you feed the young kids with the water. Of course, you wash your uh, the gold before you boil it and uh, feed. Though a lot of the time, the baby will calm down. The, you know, in the night, it will stop crying. Why? Because we say the gold is very heavy. The energy is going down. So they calm the baby's, uh, uh, you know, the fussiness and the uh, anxiousness. Uh, but we know the gold, you, you cook for 30 minutes. You won't cook anything out of the gold. The, you know, structure is so stable. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, it's uh, uh, even the structure-wise uh, similar, but the the function are totally upset. You know, for example, for the gene, uh, for the ma huang uh, uh, ephedra, the ma huang the plant, the plant of the ma huang promoting the sweat. By the root of the ma huang, stop the sweat. So it's the same plant. If you searching for the structure, uh, the, this majority it's pretty much the same. But the root of the ma huang stop the sweat, and the uh, the mm, ma huang itself promoting the sweat. And also we say there's, uh, you know, the, we call the floating wheat. You put the uh, wheat, uh, put in the water, some wheat are floating, some are sink. A uh, floating part, it's uh, immature. It's, uh, it's not uh, totally developed. By those that we call floating weight to help stop the sweating. You know, like if a woman uh, has a you know, nice sweat or half flushes, the floating weight works very effective. By structure wise, a floating weight and the regular weight are the exactly the same. By regular weight, it never worked. It doesn't work that way. And the plus the, uh, you know, you eat the bread, you're not going to stop your sweating. Uh, so we say it's energy, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, different tastes that really, if you have a lot of heat, the herbs have got to be 
bitter, bitter taste of herbs clear the heat. Uh, if you eat, the, if you take the herbs, it's pungent that clear up the wind. So the Chinese medicine is really, really beyond uh, what we say the chemical structure analysis. It's beyond that. You know, let's say um, more berry. You know, the more uh, the 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 tree. If the skin of the tree help the for the skin problem, the leaves more leaves helps for the cough because the leaves goes through the lung and the root help the bone and the branches help the limbs. So, you know, the energy, the plant, the part of the plant, similar as a human body, certain part goes to different part, even the same plant. So we know that's beyond chemical structure. And the, also I have to say, uh, right now acupuncture, it's okay for the Western society, um, you know, Western medical society, they say, okay, you can get an acupuncture treatment, just make sure they use, uh, you know, disposable needle. But for the herbs, it has a very bad name. Uh, you know, herbs cause that, herbs cause that. But sometimes you, you have to say, what, what herbs are you talking about? We have 7,000 herbs. Uh, so it's not each one of them are toxic. Maybe there's 20, 30 are toxic, FDA abandoned, we don't use. But we still have 7, 8,000 of them to choose. So if you say everywhere are bad, that's impossible. But I think, you know, pharmaceutical company, it's a little bit afraid they don't like it's a commercial, you know, they don't like uh, loose business from herbal remedy. If they don't put a break on herbal remedy in the future will develop and say, take this herbs will lower your blood pressure, take this will going to help you. Uh, you know, they don't want to lose their business, but they don't feel threatened by acupuncture. So that's why you do acupuncture treatment, they, they, don't, they don't bother you. They say, okay, just go for it. Uh, but, you know, when you talk about you take any herbs, they try to scare you. But a lot of the time, it's not necessarily, it's a real, it's a, it's a commercial, it's, it's a business, it's a business, they don't want to lose. So uh, I hope people understand, and I also want to say, uh, even though some herbs doesn't taste good, but again, you just do temporarily, uh, you have, if your mind, it's not fighting, if you feel that's uh, going to do some good in your body, you will be able to accept it. And there's uh, some technique, you, you know, when you drink the tea, you pinch your nose, and you're not going to taste anything. You just get down and have a piece of fruit or, uh, you know, raisins or something. So that will go into handling pretty well. But again, we well, health really take, you know, to develop in the health or to fight to the disease really take a lot of effort. Those kind of effort, it's, uh, we have, you know, as a practitioner, as a doctor, as a patient, we have to work in together. We uh, work as a team, so we're working together. We do the best to fight off the disease or help promoting this certain part of our, you know, function of our body. Uh, so that's really, it's the bigger picture. Uh, so thank you, thank you for everyone, and uh, I give it back to Carmen. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Liu. And then um, the next part is how does Chinese herbal medicine again tie in with treating fertility and also general hormone imbalance? Dr. Lim's going to talk about that next. Oh, Dr. Lim, you have to unmute yourself. Um, so first, I just want to say I feel really fortunate to work at TCM Healing Center because, you know, Dr. Jing and Dr. Liu both have so much so much knowledge of Chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture. And so it's been really, um, I feel, you know, thankful that they let me work here. And, and also, you know, they, they also teach me a lot regarding the herbs. Um, and like Dr. Liu said, you know, the, all the herbs have different function, you know, different personalities. They, it's, it's really to, to like understand that and use the herbs correctly. It's really an art um, to be able to know how to use it properly. Um, so, um, so basically in terms of, you know, helping with hormonal issues and especially female gynecological issues, um, it's, the history has been around for 4,000 to 5,000 years. Um, and one of the earliest writings regarding um, herbal medicine was um, almost 2,000 years ago, um, the, called the Divine Farmer's Classic of Materia Medica, Shen Lang Ben Cao Jing. And so through the ages, you know, we've had a lot of well-known authors. Um, so for example, the essential prescriptions from the Golden Cabinet, that's the Jing Kui Yao Lue, 
And so that was written by um, Zhang Zongjing. That was a well-known uh, Chinese medicine doctor also who wrote the, um, kind of wrote about febri febrile diseases as well. And then um, in the Qing dynasty, I believe, um, we had this, one of the well-known books that regarding gynecology, gynecology specifically is called Fu Qing Zhu's Gynecology. And that was around the 1700s. Um, and so much of what our understanding in terms of diagnosis and disease, um, various disease mechanisms regarding gynecology, gynecological disorders are from, the, from that book. Um, but there's also, there's many other books as well. So um, next slide. Um, so now, uh, you know, sometimes patients will ask us, like, you know, why, why do I need to take the herbs? You know, why can't I just focus on the diet or nutrition? And so um, I'm sure Dr. Jing would have a lot to say about this too, but we find that, you know, the nutrition is also really important for just general health and, you know, and can be help, is also very helpful for fertility to make sure that you're eating properly, staying away from sugar and refined foods, all these, you know, unhealthy types of um, foods. But the herbs really work at a different level from the just diet. So herbs really, we find that it, it herbs really work at a cellular level to help improve the egg quality, ovarian function. Um, and you can almost think of the herbs as being like organic compost for your body. So it's just really, nutri you know, getting a lot of nutrient nutrition also into your cells in a sense. Um, and so a couple of things that the herbs do. Um, one is that it can help to actually regulate the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. axis. So it encourages the hypothalamic release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the brain. So, and the, the gonadotropin releasing hormone is produced in your hypothalamus. And that stimulates your pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which then travel through your bloodstream and then encourage the male and female um, hormones to be produced, so estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. So the herbs actually, certain specific types of herbs that we use for fertility, um, they actually help encourage the follicle growth and um, healthy egg quality and ovarian function. And so a um, couple of ways that they do this is one, they help improve the overall blood flow and circulation through the body, um, not just the reproductive organs, but just the body in general. Um, that's why they can be also very beneficial for cardiovascular issues, for example. Um, the herbs help improve libido and sexual function because if you're if you improve the you know the communication between the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis and you're improving the egg quality ovarian function, then your hormone secretion you know everything will be more balanced. So a lot of times patients will also experience better overall better libido as a consequence of taking the herbs. Um, one is, another thing is that the herbs can help improve the cervical mucus quality. So we use certain herbs that help to improve um, estrogen function, help the secretion, the cervical mucus quality. And then also um, the herbs can help with patients going through IVF. So a lot of patients, um, for example, usually what we, we prefer to do is like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do three, we prefer to have like three months where we can really focus on work helping a woman's overall health and helping with her improving the egg quality ovarian function before she even does the IVF cycle. And that way, once she does the IVF cycle, she'll have a much better response to the medications. Um, and sometimes what can also happen is that a woman, let's say her follicles are not growing very well during the IVF cycle, but once they start taking the herbs during the cycle, we found that actually the herb, the the, her ovaries will actually respond better as well to the IVF medication and then her follicles will mature better. And she'll have, and we found that it, 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 they can actually have better quality um, embryos as well as a result. Um, another thing is that the uh, herbs can help reduce overall inflammation and they have kind of an anti-tumor effect on the body. So, so for example, some women who have, um, you know, issues like fibroids or endometriosis where they develop, you know, the fibroids in the uterus, because the herbs help to improve the overall blood flow through the, through the pelvic area and help to regulate your hormonal balance um, and also reduce the inflammation that's caused, that a lot of these kind of things like endometriosis or fibroids can cause in the lower pelvic region, 
the herbs can help to um, mitigate the symptoms that are associated with these issues. So for so example, I had a patient who she had like multiple fibroids, like basically they were, they, when they did the MRI, they, they just found so many fibroids, they didn't, couldn't even really count it. And she used to have really heavy, clotty periods um, where they would last for like 10, you know, seven to 10 days and just really heavy flooding, bleeding. And so even after taking the herb for one or two months, her symptoms like really completely got better and she, her period, the heavy bleeding, you know, stopped and she was able to not have to take so much painkillers during her period because she wasn't having the, you know, the cramps during the period. Um, so it can really affect, improve your overall quality of life. Um, I, I would say the herbs in general can help that. And, um, let's see. Oh, another thing is that, um, you know, for women who have like PMS, so sometimes we'll, we'll have patients who have severe PMS or what they call like, call it a premenstrual um, dysmorphic disorder, where they have, in Chinese medicine, we would diagnose it as like liver chi stagnation. So, you know, taking the herbs can help relieve a lot of the symptoms associated with um, premenstrual issues. So irritability, breast tenderness, breast pain, um, you know, premenstrual cramps, headaches, these things can be improved as well with the herbs. And especially a lot of times we'll use herbs to help move and regulate the liver chi. Um, for perimenopausal, menopausal symptoms also, um, we found that, um, you know, herbs that help to nourish the liver kidney yin, remove liver stagnation, and it just address their overall health. So whether, depending on their Chinese medicine diagnosis and their constitution, we try to balance everything. Then they're, you know, a lot of times they can go through the whole perimenopausal period feeling much, much better, much more normal and not having all the symptoms such as night sweats, you know, the moodiness that happens a lot of times um, with women going through perimenopause. Um, and so, you know, I think herbs in general can help with overall hormonal balance and improving your, how you feel in general. And so next slide. Um, so we, we, we like to think of, I like to think of um, basically, you know, when we're treating patients with herbal teas and everything, we, we basically really try to just bring about balance in the body. So like, like Dr. Liu was saying, a lot of times the male infertility is not due to kidney deficiency necessarily, especially with these young patients. A lot of times it can be due to damp heat or damp heat toxin in the body. So by removing the damp heat toxin or dealing with the patient's allergies or their chronic loose stools or their, you know, with the herbs, the fertility can, and their sperm count, their sperm quality can improve significantly. Um, and so we think about, you know, helping patients' health is really just like, improving the overall environment in their body. And so you think about like a, a plant, if it has the proper, if, the, if it's in the healthy, nutritious soil and there's the right microorganisms, the right bacteria in, in the soil, you know, there's not an overgrowth of yeast in the soil, then the health the plant can grow into a healthy plant. So, you know, humans are really just a part of nature as well. So we also need bacterial balance in our bodies. We need, we need you know, nutritious food. And so we need air, we need oxygen. So we basically also need to be living in a really healthy environment. And so the herbs can also help to facilitate this, um, help creating a kind of a balanced environment in the body, not to, you know, having a balance of yin and yang and also um, help. So, you know, having a balance between the spleen, chi, liver, liver function, kidney, um, you know, blood circulation. So whatever, depending on the patient's constitution, we really just try to address these issues with the herbs and help balance their overall constitution. And that can naturally help with hormonal balance and help with their fertility in general. So I think that's kind of all I had to say. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lin, for your thorough explanation of the herbs. Uh, we do get that question a lot for from our patients about what herbs are and what they really do. It is hard to explain, so hopefully everyone who's in our participants today get to understand our herbal medicine a little bit better. Um, with that being said, also, um, I'll have Dr. Jing speak next about this very shortly, is that we get calls all the time that patients, oh, the herbs taste so bad. How, I mean, how can I get it to taste better? Can I do this? Or how, how do I get myself to take it regularly? And 
also, why do I have to prepare it at this time? Or why do I have to have it after a meal? And other questions like, can I just do the acupuncture portion? Why do I have to take the herbs? So we get a lot of questions like this because patients are often don't really know what acupuncture and herbs are about. So I'm gonna have Dr. Ching explain a little bit more in depth about that as well right now. Oh, and Dr. Ching, you will have to unmute yourself before speaking. Thank you. Hi. So, and uh, lots of people, true, the truth is herbs do not taste good. But the, and, <laughs> unfortunately, so since I, since myself, I hold constantly as my childhood, constantly take herbs. I really do not like herbal taste. But when I feel something wrong, feel like a fighting cold or something, I just only take one herbs, one bag of herbs. I immediately feel better. But the herbs are really working well. But it's just unfortunately, we cannot change the taste because of these herbs is truthfully is nature of earthy. So and you cannot change that. Almost like a no pain, no gain. We can think about that way. But again, so overcome the 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 thoughts. I think is really you have have first of all have a good attitude. You want to be feel better. You want to be healed. You want to be pregnant. So if you have a good attitude, so you good mental thoughts. So I think the number one. So you thinking I can do it. I I don't have problem. And uh, while you take tea, also you have to be, when you make the tea, so in traditional Chinese medicine way, so we're talking about the herbs that have like a personality, you have your own energy, you have for taste, you have for also energy. So taste and the energy, put them together, so become the harmonized. So which means the, the herbs is all dry herbs, they don't have energy. And then they put them together when you add water. So that's when you make it, is to make energy become to, to a life. So well, so when you make the herbs, you have to bring good intention. So thoroughly stir your herbal tea. So when you thoroughly stir, instead of rashly, roughly stir, the taste be totally different. You can try yourself. So I really think you really need burning for hot water and completely thoroughly stir well. So if it's not hot enough, you can just use the microwave for 20 seconds. So, and then come out and still continue stir. By the way, you only use the wooden chopstick. You cannot use the metal. So any metal will be deplete earthy energy. So in a way, so we use the non-metal stuff like a mark uh, like a coffee mug and also like a glass jar and put porcelain per se so you can wooden chopstick to thin and uh, that's the way and you completely cool down also some people to feel like a cool down complete it tastes awful but some people i think it's just maybe room temperature or a little bit warmer than room temperature so you can depend on you individual to how to feel about it so i think only six ounce so make the regularly system for yourself with for example some people in the at night cut open so and in, in the morning to stir well and take shower and then after take shower and then you pee cool down so you can drink it so you can drink in the morning some people drink at night most is to, to say so if you have so like digestion issue. So we ask you take the tea after meal. So if you really strengthen the tongue fine, so fertility issue, you can drink it pretty much any time as long you're not hungry. And also preferably the afternoon time. So which is the afternoon is really, so like a kidney channel time. So in the between liver channel time and the, chan the tongue fine, stomach channel time this time. So we prefer you take the afternoon time. So and uh, also if you have a cold so most of the tea we usually ask you to take it in the morning so can evaporating the the toxin out to give you enhance your energy to help your body immunity to fight off the cold so and sometimes i even ask a patient take a two bag tea for a cold and for severe severe condition and uh, again sometimes so acupuncture can divide for three things number one you have sickness you really need help it's mostly people so fertility you need help menopause you need help you have a pain you need help 
but uh, some people physical regularly coming to us and just like a really maintain the balance people coming once a month then you don't need to take the tea you only can do acupuncture continue working helping your yin and yang balance to help you channel still flow so you can periodically let your acupuncture check you and you feel good you don't need to take tea so you're totally fine and it really depends on what we do we do longevity care and you do specific condition care where you really want a short period of time to really sickness care. So we have a different level to treatment and the acupuncture really helping you electric field energy, open your channels and promote circulation flow to your cellular level. And the herbs really help your chemistry energy, kind of yin and yang, both together really make the whole to use this together and to balance you. These are two. So I think in conjunction with acupuncture and herbs together will be really make a charm for help your body quickly and feel better. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jing. We're also gonna be discussing our final question. I have received some questions from a few people that we can go ahead and address at the end. So if you have any questions for any of our doctors, feel free to leave a message in the chat room and we can answer that later too. Um, all of these slides and documents um, Danielle had asked us, we will also can release a copy. If you email us contact at TCM Healing Center, you can just sign up for a copy and I'm able to send it to you for reference and for information too. Um, so the next question that we often get is, as some of you guys may know already, we work with many reproductive endocrinologists and in our experience, they see really great results in combining both Western in Eastern medicine. However, we also have people coming referred from um, specialists that we've never worked with before, or they never worked with fertility acupuncturists before, and they first always advise their patients do not take the Chinese medicine. And oftentimes it's because they don't know. Um, Dr. Jing, how can you help patients um, have them go on herbal medicine, have worked with their current doctor? Any tips for that? Okay, so answer that question. So, which means, uh, um, first of all, so I don't know that specific. I respect every fertility doctor there, so they training for, they took the job, but they don't quite understand the Chinese medicine how to working. They do not understand where they come from. They do not want those herbs interfere their hormone, interfere the the quality of herbs. But unfortunately, fortunately, so we do not do that job. So we have both training in Western and Eastern medicine. So we be able to know. So for example, so you use the gun off, follow the manipulate stimulation. We assist in you to help your egg grow, do not cause you any side effect. We fully facilitate to use the, the medication even more grow powerful. So, but unfortunately, not too many study in the background in China. So in the United States, not too much study to show them. So that's why Western medicine doctor, fertility doctor, usually, if they don't know us, they usually tell patients, do not take herbs. So I understand, but I still thinking before you use the stimulation medication, so before you yin to the cycle, you still be able to use Chinese herbs in, in conjunction with acupuncture. Just so when you do the specific cycle that time, you can stop. And you can come in more often for acupuncture. That's respectful. And uh, also, like uh, uh, we need education for Westerner and we need to have like a more data, data for Chinese herbs, how to powerful to work. That's our side. So only we say we just not can be do. It's like I guess just like uh, we need uh, both together continue working to uh, let everybody know everybody got uh, both benefits from Western Eastern. That's the future. So that's my answer. 
All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jean. I guess um, if any of the participants here are working with a fertility specialist and they're not very certain with why we prescribe herbs, we're happy to set up a phone conference to briefly talk to them and how we can work with them together. It's oftentimes, it's, again, like Dr. Jean said, it's because they don't quite understand us and we're happy to give them in-depth explanations on how it can really help. Um, we also have other doc fertility doctors who tell us all the time how much better the egg quality is during like retrieval and stuff. And so we really see the great results from working both Eastern and Western medicine together. Um, we have received a couple of questions. Anyone can answer this, but I have someone in the participants audience ask us, can we have other caffeine-free tea other than herbal tea, which we provide for fertility treatments? Um, any, who would like to answer that? Um, so you're saying like, so in combination with herbal teas that we already give? Uh, yes. So. One of the things that we recommend for patients when they first come is to go on a candidas diet. What that involves is to have no sugar foods, no yeasty foods, no um, fruit juices, which are also very sugary. But the next part is caffeine. So can they have other tea that are caffeine free? Or do you think even decaffeinated stuff still contains some caffeine and how safe is that to take? Uh, sometimes patients will ask if they can take things like red raspberry leaf tea or you know, decaffeinated green tea, those are, those are all pretty, those are fine to take um, typically. Um, I think even coffee though, like if it's decaffeinated coffee, we don't usually recommend it because it's still kind of on the acidic side. Um, so usually for male and female, we prefer more alkaline environment in the body, right? Especially as the cervical mucus better to be not too, not too acidic also. Do you have any thoughts, Dr. Jing? Oh uh, yes, and so I, I really thinking people take a little bit of like a green tea, so it's fine because the green mm -hmm. tea they have a seventy percent antioxidant, they only have a thirty percent caffeine. So they if you really strong coffee lover, so you need to switch to green tea. I think that's doable because you cannot let people go cold, cold, <laughs> cold turkey. So you have to yeah. like a bridge out. So green tea when coffee is fine, I think so. Yeah. Some people also do the trying to get wean off of coffee. They'll do the Ticino, yeah. I think, which is, is yeah, also exactly. fine as well. It's also fine. Mm -hmm. Another question I receive is also related to caffeine. I guess we have a lot of people who, here who really love coffee, like myself too, is that, um, is it okay to have coffee in the a.m. time and herbal tea in the afternoon? What do you guys recommend? I think you can have a coffee in the in the morning. So take a herbal tea in the afternoon. I think if it's if, if it's not cold. If you have a cold condition, I usually recommend people take a cold tea in the morning. So fertility tea you should be taken in the afternoon. So more kidney grounding strengthen the elements. I think Dr. Liu's uh, speaker is on mute, by the way. If you want to adopt yeah. okay. okay, so at this time, I haven't received any further questions yet. So I'm going to start wrapping up this meeting. Is there anything that you guys would like to add or any suggestions for future topics that anybody would like for us to talk about? Yeah, if anyone, I would say if anyone has, you know, any like questions they want us to answer, um, feel free, you know, you can always email us with any topics that you want us to talk about in the future um, or message it here. So we're, we're happy, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. questions. Yeah. It can be any, any topic, you know, nutrition, sleep, <laughs> Qigong or whatever. Yeah. All right, so from the sounds of it, it looks like uh, we've got everything covered today. So thank you guys so much for joining us and all of our doctors, Dr. Liu, Dr. Jing, and Dr. Lim for answering all of our questions. You guys really give me included, even after I've worked here for four years, a lot more insight on how this works. A lot of the times I'm just dealing with the patients, so I don't really get to have the knowledge side of this. So this has been really great and thank you so much. Um, for the 
future, everybody, we usually post our updates on our Instagram page, our Facebook page, which you guys can follow us at TCM Healing Center. And also we post often on our blog regarding like nutrition guidance. Every season we have like sickness, different sickness we can deal with. And we want to make sure you're eating the correct foods for each season and some or something like that. Other topics similar to that. Or you can even find our Qigong videos that are performed by both Dr. Lim and Dr. Jing. Um, we know during this time, everyone um, must be quarantining at home for a while. And so we highly advise to maybe even just go to your backyard or like a private area and follow our Qigong videos. It's really good for the mind and body and really promote the lung health, which is very important for the immune system during this time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and end this session right now. Um, Dr. Jing, Dr. Liu, Dr. Lam, let's go ahead and say bye for everyone and thank you. Bye for everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Carmen. Thank you everyone. for everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jing. <laughs> <laughs>